So good morning, everyone. Um, I've been asked by Carolyn to uh, provide a perspective on uh, African youth challenges that complements Yali's focus on young African leaders. And I won't be speaking about leaders, uh, the elite leaders here. Uh, to do this, I'll begin with the following irony. Um, while youth in Africa are demographically dominant, most see themselves as members of an outcast minority, and they're treated that way. And that's, that's our challenge, it seems to me. So this irony lays at the core of my forthcoming book, which is called The Outcast Majority, um, War Development and Youth in Africa. But the irony also positions the central challenge before us as youth exclusion, not youth demographics. Um, in the youth field, the exclusion issue is routinely overshadowed by youth bulge, youth bulge concerns, which are usually illuminated with quantitative data and correlations, not the views of youth. My perspective is, you know, my experience in looking at all this information is that it's numbers and it's correlations. And the views and perspectives of, of the people that, people that uh, they're so afraid of, which are young African men or young Arab men, um, aren't part of the discussion. It's, this, this, this is a subject that's usually talked about young people. They're not engaged in this, and that's a mistake because it, it promotes distortions. Um, one result is a tendency to see urban, unemployed, and war-affected male youth as a central cause of political stability. Yet often the reality is the opposite. Even when youth are faced with desperate and humiliating circumstances, most manage to resist engagement in violence or remain more or less peaceful. I mean, the young people. But generally speaking, given what's going on, most of them are quite peaceful. And it's a small percentage, even during a war zone, even during times of war, that actually get involved in violence. So one fundamental reason why, it seems to me, youth are so misunderstood is that nobody really seems entirely sure just who they are. So um, here are some UN definitions. A child is either zero, ages 0 to 17 or 0 to 14. That's a child. An adolescent is uh, everyone ages 10 to 19. OK. Um, a teenager are, is everyone ages 13 to 19. This is, these are the UN frameworks, OK? Uh, a young person is between the age of 20 and 24. And a youth is between the age of 15 and 24. So of course everyone's confused. What the heck is a youth? <laughs> now, to make it even worse, is most uh, governments define youth, uh, African governments, as somewhere between 15 and 35. So it's all over the place. Um, uh, but here are four related concerns. First, um, often there can be confusion about the gender of youth. Since youth often is a code word, word for male youth, it's very interesting. When there's discussion about gender, gender usually means women. And, and I'm getting this actually from African government officials in, in particular. Um, but the subtext is, is, is that gen gender is the subtext is females, usually women, usually middle-aged women, or girls. Um, and for youth, the subtext usually is male youth. So female youth are the ones that are really largely ignored. And that's kind of an alarming situation um, in both these sort of frameworks for work. A second concern is that there's a tendency to ignore profound class differences within youth populations. Um, you often hear about, we need to do something for the youth. Well, usually when you say the youth, you mean, uh, you mean everyone. And, and what happens in my experience most of the time is that elite male youth are the ones who get in and get the attention and get the programming. When UNICEF says we need a youth voice, they usually can speak English eloquently. They're usually very, um, they're usually very uh, well educated. And they're usually university grads who don't have a job. So what do they talk about? I need a job. The, thing, the problem is employment. And um, things are much more difficult. And I think it's important to realize that I've never been to a country in Africa where I haven't found deep suspicion and animosity uh, that divide elite and non-elite youth. They live in different worlds. And the elites are the minority. And they do dominate conversations. Um, a third point is that too many African uh, government officials and community level leaders disregard or ignore poor youth. Um, when you hear about bad boys and bad girls, that's often a lot of the youth. And they're disregarded. They don't count. And, and that's a big problem. Uh, 
So, but a fourth current concern is embodied, embodied in the following policy question. How do youth become adults? And what happens if they fail? And what we find in all these places is that it's almost impossible for most youth to become accepted as adults, as adult men, as adult women. Um, and, uh, and so in many countries, the situation is, is that they're humiliated and they're looked on as failures and there's no way out for most of them. In fact, that's a common phrase. There's no way out uh, of these situations. So I'm gonna look at this issue of failed uh, adulthood um, by drawing on field research very briefly with youth in Central Africa. Now, to become a man in Rwanda and Burundi, a male youth must build a house before getting married, having children, and supporting a family. Um, and masculinity is a very, this is true in the United States, I mean, this seems to be true everywhere. Masculinity is very uh, tenuous and fragile. Femininity is not, generally speaking. A man, can, you can be seen to a man, to have, be a man, you're married, you have a family, you have a job, up, oh, you lose your job. Now your masculinity is under threat. Am I really a man? I'm not, well, I'm a man, but not like a man who has a job. And th this can happen, this is a big problem. Uh, all over the world, and it's a big problem also in Africa. Now, to become a woman, becoming a woman in Central Africa, like in many parts of the world, is completely dependent on masculinity. You have to have somebody to marry. So female youth must marry and have children, but you better have somebody to marry, and increasingly there's no one for them to marry in Central Africa, among other places, because male youth are unable to complete their house. In Rwanda, poverty and severe government re regulations make it almost impossible for most male youth to build a house. Now this is the most obvious issue to government officials on the ground uh, in, in, uh, in Rwanda. When I was asked, this was originally research, it's now a book called Stuck, um, but when I was asked to, um, originally it was research for the World Bank, and they asked me to brief all these uh, donor agencies about my findings, the, the amazing thing was is nobody knew this. How could this be? How could all these donor officials, all these donor agencies with shelves of, of studies not know that the most basic issue is that youth in Rwanda, virtually all of them, can't become a, seen as adults. And that's a tough place to, to be a failed adult because people really go out of their way to humiliate you is one of the things we learned. They, um, so, um, poverty, land shortages makes building a house very hard, um, um, but the, the government regulations make it difficult. Now in Burundi, the government regulations have nothing to do with it. In Rwanda, it's, it's almost impossible to meet the standards and the regulations that the government has set out for building a house. Male, I mean, 95% in male youth or something can't do it. In Burundi, um, you don't have those problems, but, and, and also the culture is more forgiving. They're, they don't humiliate you as much, is one of the things we found in our research. Um, uh, and uh, it doesn't weigh as heavily, so if everybody's a failed adult, failed man, failed woman, practically, but it's not as shameful in Burundi as it is in Rwanda. So, um, how do you transform uh, how do you transform the youth bulge challenge into an opportunity? Uh, I think that's the title of our subject, yes? Okay. Okay, so here are f three final thoughts. Um, first, there's a need to address the fallout from failed manhood. Failed adulthood, but failed manhood is a real big one because it all, it, everything falls on that. Just to give you an example, uh, in doing research in Rwanda, um, uh, uh, it's illegal to be, get married un, be, until you're age 21. Okay, so what about a female youth is 28? Can she get married? Oh no, she's too old. No one will marry her. What about 24? Eh, maybe 25. So for female youth, the window of opportunity for getting married before seeing, being seen as, a, as an old lady, as a spinster, they call them old ladies, um, is about four years. Imagine the pressure. And the likelihood of failure is so high in that country. It's just incredible. So of course they have, everything's, everything's fertile in Rwanda, so they have lots of children. Unmarried mothers is a big issue. That's very humiliating 
and it's extremely common, Rwanda, Burundi, and elsewhere. So in Kigali, there's a, here's an example of what happens. You get embarrassed and humiliated in the, in, the, in the rural areas, you go to the city. That's one of the main reasons that um, Kigali is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Um, so desperate and humiliated male youth go there, and the ones who really don't make it are known as hopeless youth. And it seems to me that this is a potentially a very serious security threat. These are really desperate people. And um, people explain to me, if somebody came along and said, let's go, here's a gun, the boys would be ready. They got nothing. They're looked on as losers. Um, in Burundi, it's different. The ruling party has recruited many desperate male youth into their youth wing, the Imbonera Kure. And the youth wing, they actually go out and say, you know, you're seen as a, a victim, so join. And you can't really say no. So these youth wingers conduct, basically conduct surveillance and intimidation on behalf of the state. And they've blanketed the country. This is a very, very alarming situation that's going on there. And they appear to have virtual impunity against extortion, theft, sexual, and other kinds of violence. There seems to be a lot of sexual violence involved, too. Everything's free. And even the police you know, can't control them, which is quite a, a concern. So um, opposition parties have responded, of course, by forming their own youth wings. It's a volatile situation. So a second uh, issue to keep in mind is um, is the need to understand local context before developing a response. Here's an example. Um, the makeup of violent urban gangs can be quite different. From my research in Bujumbura in Burundi, most gang members are thought to be ex-combatants. But in Juba, in South Sudan, most gang leaders are thought to be relatives of high government officials, um, while many gang members reportedly are orphans. So it's a different dynamic if, there, if we're going to target these particular groups. So this contrast underscores the need to fashion local responses to security threats. Okay, so finally, when the focus is excluded youth majorities and not the youth leaders that Yali is targeting so, so impressively, it seems to me, here's a, a helpful rule of thumb. Find out who the so-called bad youth are, the ones the mainstream leaders despise and work with them. Thanks very much.